All right, turn to Romans chapter 8. As we continue, we're going to look at just a few verses, actually six. Uh, you might even say six and a half. We're going to go and touch on verse 18 just a little bit. It's kind of part two of the spirit-controlled uh, life as we're making our way through the, the book of Romans. Sometimes we can lift verses out of the book of Romans, and we call it the Romans road because it really tells us about salvation, how to come to faith in Jesus Christ. In the same context, a lot of people will refer to chapter 8 as the glory road. It was Dr. Barnhouse that I may have mentioned that said when your Bible falls off the shelf at, the, at your home uh, and it opens, it probably should open to Romans chapter 8. And it really does for a lot of people. Very meaningful. And uh, these couple of verses uh, we're going to look at this morning are, are, are very powerful. Stuart Briscoe tells the story of... Uh, uh, of a couple that were illiterate and the man got saved. It was some time ago and it was through the ministry of the Salvation Army in Great Britain when, uh, again, they do excellent social service, uh, drug rehab uh, kinds of things today. There's a few churches around, but they were a little more prevalent at one time and he was attending one of those churches. But uh, he loved it. He was growing in the Lord, but he noticed that uh, in that day, in that era, everybody there wore a red sweater. So he came home a little disheartened uh, uh, one Sunday after church and mentioned it to his wife and she says, well, it's not a problem. I can just, I can knit you a red sweater, which she did and he probably wore his red sweater to church the next week. He came home uh, after that service and also a little disheartened and uh, she said, well, did everyone like your red, red sweater? And she says, well, uh, they did, except that I noticed that all of them have something embroidered on the, on the chest of their red sweaters. And then that day, the Salvation Army was a circle that included the words blood and fire. Uh, of course, again, both of them could not read or write. Uh, he just knew that he didn't have something written on the front of his shirt. They lived across from a business uh, in a downtown area, and she saw a sign uh, on the door and thought it was a very nice sign and the lettering and so forth. So she copied it down, and then the next week she embroidered on his red sweater. He went to church that week. Uh, and, uh, and then she awaited his return. When he came home, he was very happy, he was very excited, and said that everybody loved his sweater. In fact, several people had commented they would rather have his sweater than to have their sweater. What she had written from that business was a sign that says, this business under new management. <laughs> that is our subject here. When we come to faith in Jesus Christ, we are no longer condemned. Jesus said in Matthew 5, 24, whoever hears my word, believes him who sent me, will not be condemned. They have crossed over from death to life. We're no longer condemned. That was our first principle of righteousness. The second one is justification. We're justified by faith. And we said that when we began this chapter, the there, therefore, double adverbs referring back, not just to the previous context, but the main point that Paul was making is that we are justified by faith. That justification is when God declares us to be completely innocent, righteous, in Him, for every sin we will ever commit, have committed, or you might be committing right now, because you're not paying attention enough. <laughs> but uh, forgive it of all of it. And then he goes into the third principle of righteousness, sanctification, the process by where God uh, changes us and conforms us by His Spirit to be more like a Jesus Christ. Well, verse 12, again, begins with a therefore, uh, and uh, uh, not exactly the same, but a different word that he uses often for therefore. It's not simply a, a reference back. Now, remember what I just said. Certainly, it entails that, but it means a little more than that in the Greek. It means this is a key section. This is very important. I hope you're paying attention. It is because of what I've said that I can now say this to you, uh, and it is important. So let's look at the first principle, uh, which uh, I've said to help us uh, go through this, we have a duty to live through the power of the Spirit. Verse 12, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die, but if by the Spirit you will put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Uh, no longer uh, a debt to the sin nature. Why should we, sh we should have a debt or a duty to that old sin nature? It never really did us any good anyway. Paul says, we owe it nothing. We should go on and now live according to the Spirit. That's where our debt, that's where our duty really should be. It was the Holy Spirit who convicted us, who revealed Christ to us, who imparted eternal life to us when we trusted Christ. 
He is the spirit of life. He is the spirit of truth. Why would we not avail ourselves to him and allow him to completely control our spirit? Remember Paul's, uh, uh, at the end of chapter 7, before he began this section, he said, uh, you know, I struggle. What I want to do, I don't do. What I don't do, I end up doing. O wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God in Christ Jesus. Again, what was going to save him was not a what, it was a who. Certainly it is Jesus Christ, our Savior. But as we began this section with the, there's no condemnation, and beautifully it ends at the end, and there is no separation. It is all about the security of the believer. Uh, we want to avail ourselves. He says we should have a duty, an obligation to live our lives controlled by the Spirit of God. Otherwise, well, it's just a frustrating life. You know, it's a mistake for people to think that they've come to faith in Jesus Christ, they've been justified by His Spirit, and now i just got to do the best that I can. That's a frustrating life. Rather than to allow ourselves to be controlled by the Spirit of God. That's what He wants. And Paul says, hey, we don't know that to the, sin, the old sin nature. We should live according to the Spirit. Secondly, he says we uh, are not to live according to the dictates of that nature because it only brings death. If we live according to the sin nature, go after the old sin nature, uh, in our own strength, trying to live the Christian life, it's a frustrating experience. It only brings death. Similar message, same kind of a sense in 1 Corinthians 6, 18, where Paul talks again about the Holy Spirit indwelling the believer, where he says, flee sexual immorality. Every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. Or do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and who, uh, and if you are not your own? Uh, for you were bought at a price, therefore glorify God in your body uh, and in your spirit, which are God. So we have a duty, an obligation, is not to the old sin nature, and it's not to live according to the dictates that we used to live under, driving us to sin. Why? He said, gives us three reasons. The Holy Spirit now dwells in us. Uh, in our bodies. Uh, and therefore, when we commit sin, in this case, he mentioned sexual sin, which he makes this, a distinction between it and other sins because it's a sin that's committed in the body. And what's horrifying about that, it's the body that's the temple of the Holy Spirit. And he says, uh, the other reason we shouldn't be doing that, not only does it lead to death, but after all, we're not our own anyway. We were bought with a price by the blood of, of Jesus Christ. Every reason in the world that we should give ourselves over, yield ourselves over to the Holy Spirit. Let's look at another phrase that where Paul uses the same idea of putting something to death in terms of the sin nature. Colossians 3, 5. Therefore put to death your members which are on the earth, fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil, desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. You're into these things, you're not worshiping God, you're worshiping something else. Because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. Again, the phrase, put to death. Uh, so what are the deeds of the flesh were to put to death? Well, this is not all inclusive, but he mentions a few. Again, sexual things. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, uh, evil desire, covetousness, which he says is uh, idolatry. And certainly the list could go on. But he says it's a mistake to not live the Christian life under the power and the constant influence of the Holy Spirit. Uh, after all, we owe nothing to the old sin nature. Why would we live according to his any longer? Secondly, uh, and, uh, and we'll spend certainly uh, most of our time on this, he says we've been given a new dynamic relationship uh, with God. But just even before I read this, keep in mind that you know, we're so familiar with these phrases that we're the sons of God, we're the children of God, and yeah, we can cry out to God, and we can call him Father and all this, but keep in mind this Jewish audience that Paul's writing to here in Rome, again, there's, there, he will turn his thoughts to the, the few Gentiles that are in the church at the time, but primarily it's a Jewish audience. Uh, what he's about ready to say here was, uh, with, earth, with earth shaking, uh, they could probably uh, imagine uh, the, uh, uh, when they read these words, if they believed them, they probably wept because they could hardly believe what he was saying. Uh, similar to what Jesus said when his disciples came to him and said, John teaches his disciples to pray. You teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, pray in this way. Our Father who art in heaven, right there, they're probably just about fainted. They don't even say the name of God. What's the name of God? Don't say it. We'll just say Lord. Why do you write it? 
We don't put a vowel because we don't want you to even think that. He's the one that was on that mountain that was, that was shaking, that was thundering, that was dark, and only Moses could go up and meet with him. Only Moses could. We went up, we prayed we'd all die. This is the God who said the beginning of wisdom, the beginning of understanding everything is to fear God. And they were all taught to fear God. Also to love God, but that fear of God. We, we are supposed to fear God as well. Paul says it several times. But do you understand that when we just have such a different concept of how we can come to God because we're on this side of the cross. Uh, but these things were, were just dynamic. They were earth shaking. Uh, this is what Paul says. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and if children and heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. So I've uh, certainly listed uh, six. There may be other aspects of this idea, this new dynamic relationship, but the first one uh, is uh, really what we've already been talking about. It, it includes being led by the Spirit of God, verse 14, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, that we can be led by the Spirit of God. This means uh, it's for as many. That means everyone. It's not an exclusive, it excludes a few. Maybe someday when I'm more mature, you know, God's Spirit will lead me. You know, as soon as you are born again of God's Spirit, uh, God's Spirit will want to lead you and guide you uh, and direct your life. And, uh, and, and where he wants to take us is, uh, is wonderful. The psalmist speaks of this in what uh, is uh, very familiar to most of us, Psalm 23, when he says, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me to lie down in green pastures. He, he leads me. He leads me beside still, uh, still waters. Uh, quiet and a peaceful life. Maybe I'm getting old, and that sounds good to me. <laughs> I don't know, maybe you're 18 or 19. Awesome action, man. Well, go to the mission field. You know, I mean, you know, that'll lead you wherever you want to go. But uh, it sounds good to me to be led by still and, and quiet waters. One of the things I, I enjoy about teaching at the Bible College is actually the drive there. I certainly enjoy being with the, the kids down there at the school on Thursdays and stuff. And it's at Coco Marina, Buzz Church. So I drive around by Makapu uh, every week. And... Uh, uh, so it's just interesting to watch the ocean and everything. And uh, a week ago, on uh, Thursday, the winds were just cranky and it was all white capped and, uh, uh, and everything. I remember, uh, Scratch there, remember one time we were taking somebody around the islands and we were looking at a blowhole. It was just gnarly out there and all white capped. And I said, man, I wouldn't want to be out there on a day like today. He said, we were. Which we were one time. But that's another story. But, uh, <laughs> but it's like that. It's not inviting. It's not inviting. It's like, uh, man, it's it's impressive. Uh, and to see those waves crash against the rocks around by uh, uh, by Sandy's and stuff, it's uh, uh, it, it's amazing. It's disturbing in a way. You wouldn't want to be there. You wouldn't want to be uh, out there. But uh, this last week, man, it was a beautiful day, and the winds had dropped, and it was it was calm, and it was inviting. And it was like, on those days, when it's dead wind, it's like, I want to be in the water. <laughs> when it went drop, there's still some uh, surf out there. Uh, man, even if there's no surf, just to get the kayak and get, uh, get in the water, it's inviting. He makes me to lie down. The Holy Spirit will yield ourselves. What a picture for us, the quiet and peaceful life. Verse 3, he goes on and restores my soul. He leads me in the paths of righteousness for his, his namesake. The Holy Spirit will always lead us to a place of righteousness, never unrighteousness. If you find yourself living an unrighteous life, then the Holy Spirit's not the one that led you there. If you find yourself doing unrighteous things, it's not the Holy Spirit that is controlling your life. He'll always lead us into a place of righteousness. Again, it's his desire to conform us to be in the image of Jesus Christ. Uh, a couple other references, I won't turn there, but just to uh, mention the idea of Galatians 5.18, he leads us into freedom. Romans 2, 4, he leads us into repentance. Deuteronomy 8, he leads us into safety. And John 10, he leads us as the good shepherd. Uh, John 6, 13, Jesus says this about the coming of the Holy Spirit. Again, uh, Jesus on this occasion, before his departure and his death and so forth, could have 
could have, maybe should have been, we think, a little more trouble about, about the boys, about those guys who were still arguing over who's the greatest in the kingdom, who gets to sit next to who every time they sit down at the meal. Things may not have been looking too good for the advancement of the kingdom of God at that point. Jesus doesn't seem to be worried about it because he knows the Holy Spirit is going to come and it's going to be the game changer for every one of those guys. Look at uh, verse 13 of that chapter. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth. For he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. The spirit of truth will guide you into all truth. Jesus wasn't really concerned because God's spirit was going to come. He was going to give them, give us discernment. How does he primarily do that? Through the word. When we read the word, now that we're born again of God's spirit, now that we decide to yield to and be controlled by the spirit of God, no longer an obligation of the old nature. I want to live for the new nature and what Christ can do in and through my life. Now when I read the word, it kind of comes alive to me. It starts to make sense to me. It ministers uh, to my heart. It makes sense to me. It resonates uh, to me. It gives me a desire to draw closer to the Lord because of time I've spent in the Word. The Holy Spirit will guide me into all truth. Uh, The issues of my life and the big pictures of things and how I should be living my life to be a better father, a better husband, all the aspects of life, how to handle my finances, raise my kids, and everything else, the big issues, I can actually go to the Scriptures and receive instruction. He'll give you the truth. There's a world out there that will give you a different picture about all of those things. And their importance or lack thereof. But the Holy Spirit will, through His Holy Word, will always lead us into truth. What about the things that we don't have a chapter and verse? What about those issues of, do I move here or take that promotion or not? Can He lead me in those things? Yeah, He can lead you in those things as well. One great example is, well, the Apostle Paul, as he went out on his missionary journeys, remember, he kind of had a plan believed it was from the Lord, he would go and uh, and launch into major, major cities, major metropolitan cities, a lot of seacoast towns and so forth. If he could get something started there, a church planted there, preach the gospel, get a little church going, appoint some uh, elders and leaders, uh, maybe if they have problems, send uh, Timothy back or Titus back, get them back on track again, then he would leave it up to them to take the gospel out to the outlying areas and so forth. So he had a plan, God was blessing, and all of a sudden it all seemed to stop. The wheels came off the cart. It's in the Acts chapter 16. But notice the faithfulness of the Holy Spirit. Paul didn't have a chapter and verse. He needed to be led by the Spirit of God. Now when they had gone through Phrygia in the region of Galatia, they were forbidden by the Holy Spirit to preach the word in Asia. After they had come to Mysia, they tried to go, go down to Bithia, but the Spirit did not permit them. So passing by Mysia, they came down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia stood and pleaded with him, saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. Now after he'd seen the vision, immediately we sought to go to Macedonia, concluding that the Lord had called us to preach the gospel to them. You're saying, yeah, that's what I need, a vision in the night. But notice all what happened before that. Here's where they wanted to go. They wanted to go on into Asia Minor. He had no intention of going to Southern uh, Europe at that point in time. But the Lord had other plans. And the Lord would override his plans, and that was fine with Paul. How did he stop him from going? We don't know. But it wasn't with a chapter and a verse. He says, maybe they got sick. Maybe the wind stopped blowing. Maybe the boat got a hole in it. I don't know. But he just stopped him. He wouldn't let him go. Sometimes the Lord does that. He stops us in our tracks. We think, boy, there's something wrong with the world, our relationship with God, and everything else. Sometimes just the Holy Spirit working in our lives. And then they want to do something, and the Lord wouldn't permit, and the Holy Spirit wouldn't permit. Uh, And now when they're really kind of like, wow, what do we do? Uh, Let's dial this back for a minute, and uh, and what's going on? I'm sure there was a lot of prayer going on with those guys. There's the we section. Luke is there with them as he uh, is writing uh, in second person. Second person uh, saying that we're there, I'm with them, I'm experiencing these things with Paul. I'm sure they began to pray, uh, and as they did, that Paul gets uh, the vision of the Macedonian man calling him come over. And of course, they, they went on and had a tremendous ministry. It worked out beautifully, right? Remember, they got beat up, thrown that prison, thought they were going to die. Just, it was awesome. No, oh, God was in it. You know, it doesn't, because God's leading, that doesn't mean it's all, all of the, you know, going to work out wonderfully. 
But uh, they had a sense that God was directing, God was leading. And even if they had been up, the, uh, the jail there in Philippi, what did they do? They were just worshiping the Lord, trusting God. What does he have next for them? God will lead us and guide us and direct us. He is the spirit of truth, even when we don't have a chapter and a verse, if we'll yield ourselves to him, come to him. And I think that, uh, you know, he likes it. He likes it when we don't know for sure. Because often when we're trying to follow the Lord on certain things, we really don't know for sure. Now, I get that a lot. Pastor, I've been praying about this, but we just don't really know for sure. But what are you sensing? We're kind of sensing the Lord uh, uh, is leading us this way. I'd go with that if I were you. You know, I think the Lord likes it when we're going, oh, well, Lord, I don't really know. We're just kind of trusting you because, you know, I don't really know for sure. Yeah, I sure hope you're in this. And we're, you know, I think the Lord's like, all right. This is good. You're talking to me like all the time. Versus, we have some sense of, yeah, God definitely called me to this. I got it, Lord. Check in with you later once I arrive or whatever. You know, I think He likes it when we're just trusting Him and taking a, a, a step uh, at, a, at a time. A number of years ago, Kathy and I had the opportunity to uh, go to the Big Island and see the volcano when it was erupting. It used to be an event. Now it's like a 20-year event. It's not quite the event that it was. But back in the day, uh, when we were younger, uh, if it erupted, if you could get on a plane, you went over there because it may only go for a matter of days. And it was one of those occasions we, we flew over, and, um, uh, and Dave and Tracy had already, already made uh, that, uh, that journey not that long before that. And so they told us, go at night. Don't go during the day. Go at night. So walk in at, before the sun sets and uh, make sure you take flashlights and follow their instructions you get down to the park rangers you know are directing you where to where to park and we want to go where it's dumping uh, into the ocean that's where the real uh, show of uh, of, uh, of nature is and uh so we we walked in uh, got in by about five and we were kind of seated and you know the lava's pouring down the hill it's dumping in the ocean you have the steam coming up as it hits the water and now that beautiful sunset is going down that would just be enough right there but then as it begins it gets dark uh, there are a couple of stars out there <laughs> in the southern part of the big island and now you can see every ember every flow every piece of lava as it explodes as it hits the water you can't see it during the, the day uh, and it was spectacular we were there for quite a while it was a beautiful evening and now it's time to go back to our car to walk back across that lava field, you know the type of lava it is? It's ah, uh, ah, uh, lava. That if you try to walk on it without slippers, you're going, you got it. And uh, so it's, it, it hurts if you, if you fall, kind of lava. Uh, and so the park ranger instructs you, won't let you in if you don't have a flashlight, instructs you to stand uh, by an orange cone that's got reflector tape on it, take your flashlight, and then kind of scan the area until you see the next orange cone with the reflector tape, and then walk directly there. Don't turn to the right, don't turn to the left. Uh, it could be the end of your life. Just follow that right to that orange cone. When you arrive, then you get your light and you find the next orange cone and you keep walking in a straight line until you arrive back to the car. That's where the Lord leads us very often by His Spirit. We want to know the end of the story, the whole deal, where we're going, what's the outcome. And He said, just, just, just that little part right over there. Are you sure? Are you sure? Are you sure? Yeah. I don't have a chapter and verse for this, Lord. You can just go to that little light that you can see. Uh, and I'll lead and guide you from there. Uh, God does want to control our lives. He does lead us uh, very, very straightforward in terms of his word on so many things pertaining to our lives. Uh, it's helpful if we're kind of uh, obeying that. <laughs> if we want to also lead us in other areas. Lord, I could kind of care less what you say about these things, but I'd sure like to know about this. Nah. Probably doesn't work. You know, we, we want to be living lives to what God know, has already shown us in terms of his word, so that when we hit those issues of life where there is no chapter and verse, we've already learned how to trust him and his faithfulness. That's what the Apostle Paul and Luke and the boys found out here, uh, and certainly we can still experience that uh, in our lives today. The second aspect of this dynamic relationship includes becoming sons of God, also in verse 14. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Uh, by the way, that's a term never used of a person in the Old Testament, always of angels. And God now takes a term only of used of angels and says, that's what I'm going to call you guys. You know, we've got to read that. Like, ah, yeah, sons of God, kind of get that. Like, what's that daughters of God? Well, it's, it's a term. It's a term of angels. Uh, and now he says, I'm, you're now going to be known. 
uh, if you're going to have my Holy Spirit living in you, controlling you, directing your life, uh, my relationship with you is going to be different. And I just elevated you. Elevated you to the status of what angels were who stand and worship in the presence of God in the Old Testament. We're pretty powerful spiritual beings. And he says, I'm not going to use that term anymore for them. I'm going to begin to use that for you. He uses a couple of terms here. Uh, it's the, the Greek word uh, technon for children, kind of a normal use. But he uses another one uh, later, uh, weos, which uh, uh, when he uses the term son or son or an heir, he wants to make sure that uh, we understand that we're both, uh, both aspects, uh, an heir as well as a, uh, as a son, which leads us into this idea of uh, adoption. God wants to make sure that we know that we're in his family. There's certain ways that you can be in a family. You can be born into a family. Uh, you can be adopted into a family. And the third way is to marry into a family. And we've done all three. We've been born again. We've been born into God's family. Here Paul will tell us we've been adopted into God's family. And the third one is the church is the bride of Christ. We've been, in a sense, married into God's family. In every way, we can be a child of God. He describes it for us uh, in the New Testament. So the third uh, dynamic relationship includes this idea of adoption. And I realize that, uh, that uh, some, some people, I mean, sometimes we don't really understand what this means uh, in terms of a first century setting. F.F. F. Bruce says this, the term adoption may smack somewhat uh, artificially uh, in our years. But in the first century AD, an adopted son was a son <coughs> deliberately chosen by his adopted father to perpetuate his name and inherit his estate. He was no bit inferior in status to a son born in the ordinary course of nature and might well enjoy the father's affection more fully and reproduce the father's character more wholly. And, uh, and that's the idea. God says you're now adopted in. Uh, you were born again to my family, but now you're adopted in. Uh, and therefore we can, as he says, be led of the spirit. The verb there means willingly. He wants to lead us. He wants to guide us. He loves us like his children, but we must yield to him. Uh, Amos the prophet said, how can two walk together unless they agree to do so? And, uh, and if we're going to walk, be led, all these metaphors uh, of the Holy Spirit, we certainly have to agree. And certainly we can refuse, we can grieve the Holy Spirit, uh, but uh, Paul says, why would you want to go back and somehow satisfy an obligation or a duty to your old sin nature? when you can have so much more in terms of this relationship. The dynamic, the fourth thing, includes access. Notice where he uses the term, we cry, Abba, Father. We cry or we cry out could be translated, yell, yell. And if, uh, trust you, nobody's asleep, or I would have done that a lot louder right there. We yell. And it's that term used of a, of a little child in distress who's yelling for his father. So it's, it's a yell, but it's a cry as well that I need you, you know, we're arguing. Uh, that's the idea. We cry out, uh, Abba, Father. Abba, again, sim simply means a term of endearment, like Papa, it's an Aramaic word. Uh, we could use it the same meaning, dear Father. We might say Daddy, and so forth. Uh, but again, it was, it was never used of a Jewish person in addressing God. Uh, I don't know if somebody would hit him over the head if they prayed using that word or what, but it would never be used. Uh, but this is all, all very different. But Jesus had used it. Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane the night before he, uh, he goes to the cross, uh, when he takes Peter, James, and John and basically pulls away from the others and says, will you wait and pray for me just one hour? And he goes, uh, and he's praying such intense prayers at that point, trying to prepare himself for what that lays ahead of him. Uh, he prays like this, part 1436. There it is, Abba, Father, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me. Not, not what I will, but what you will. We say this is a dynamic in terms of access. You think you can pray to God anytime, come to him at any time? He says, you can address me the way Jesus did the night before he went on the cross. I would say that's, that's uh, access. And, uh, and we, uh, of course, we have the reference in Hebrews that we we're to come before his throne of grace. We're to come, you know, some translations say boldly, and we kind of get the wrong idea. But it means confidently. We can come 
any time to him because we're controlled by the Holy Spirit. Fifth, the dynamic relationship includes uh, being no longer in bondage to fear. This is important. Verse 15, for you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption. And uh, it's the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives to eliminate fear. And sometimes we need it eliminated. So did the Apostle Paul. I mean, there's, there's times we find in his missionary travels where we have the angel of the Lord, or the Lord himself, standing next to the Apostle Paul saying, do not be afraid. When God says that, it's because you're afraid. <laughs> I really wasn't afraid. You're afraid. Do not be afraid. Even the Apostle Paul. I mean, this tremendous Christian, but just he's just a regular guy. Uh, he had the same uh, emotional makeup that, uh, that we have, uh, the same concerns. And, um, uh, man, many times this guy got beat up. He'd have, he'd have reason to fear every time he went to a new city. You know, he didn't, didn't, didn't know what the hotels looked like, but he knew the inside of every prison, the very place that he went to. Uh, yet, uh, we can be delivered from, from fear. And there's a lot of things out there that make us fearful, isn't there? If you're not sure, just watch the news. <laughs> it'll, make you, you know, it'll make you fear. Of course, uh, uh, but the Holy Spirit can eliminate our bondage to fear. It's not that we don't experience it on occasion, but we don't have to be in bondage to it. It doesn't have to be the thing that drives our, our life. Uh, John says this in his uh, first epistle, chapter 4, verse 18, there's no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves torment or, or judgment, punishment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. There's no fear in, in love. Uh, we have nothing to fear from God, uh, certainly. There, there's no punishment coming. We've been justified uh, by faith in Jesus Christ and His finished work on, uh, on the cross. There's no no fear yet uh, for the future. I didn't get it printed out and put out there for you uh, yet, yeah, but our other missionary that's in uh, Israel and Tel Aviv, we, uh, <coughs> our good friends that we celebrated Passover for many years here in Hawaii before they uh, went to uh, Israel. And... Um, uh, they were there only a very short time, and then, uh, and then Bill's wife Marcy uh, uh, cancer and uh, kind of went through uh, the treatments and kind of the normal course of the things, and it was a matter of months. And she was uh, with, with the Lord. Uh, he returned uh, back to uh, Israel. He's been uh, serving there with his kids uh, ever ever since. The youngest, he just went up and got to see him uh, be sworn into the idea for his kids to uh, serve in the uh, Israeli military there. Uh, in this newsletter at the beginning, uh, Bill re recalls uh, Marcy's uh, going to be with the Lord uh, and, and being kneeling on the floor over her, uh, speaking to her, uh, listening to her, and, uh, and literally uh, there to hear her last, uh, her last breath. Uh, very, very touching, of course. But then he remarks, he says, and then right before that, though, this, uh, this incredible smile and, uh, came over her face. And she's like looking, but she was gone. He said, you know, I've never feared that. And to know that, to be there and actually get, get to see that, someone that's fully aware of the angels coming from them, the gave them in the presence of God. He goes, you know, I've never feared that since, since then. You know, we're not anxious. We all the, you know, how many want to go to heaven? Everybody raise their hand. How many want to go right now? You know, that's not as many hands. But, uh, but it's, uh, we don't no longer have to be in bondage to fear. It's not that we aren't afraid at times, even the Apostle Paul was, but we don't have to live in a continual, habitual state of, of being afraid. Uh, there's no reason for it. Uh, 2 Timothy 1.7, one of my verses that uh, man, I've recalled to mind uh, many times uh, in the night, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and love and, and, uh, and sound of mind. When there's a sense of fear coming over you, uh, that's not Jesus. That's not Jesus. That's not the Holy Spirit. That's the other guy. That's the other guy. You know, sometimes we just have, you know, hey, there's things going on. Something happens. You know, uh, we're concerned. And, and we have to assimilate information to kind of get it through our brain and filter through what we know about the Lord and kind of get in context. And we can kind of, okay, we're trusting the Lord. We're okay. And it's a process uh, that we all go through. There's other times it's a little heavier than that. It may seem to come out of nowhere. Uh, and it may be at times when you're launching out to do something for the Lord you haven't done before. The Lord's about ready to use you. Uh, and there's a sense of fear that comes over you. 
uh, and in those times, you need to recognize that's not, that's not Jesus, that's the other guy. I need to be calling out to the Lord. I need to be thinking about these verses. I need to recognize that's not the Lord, and I'm, I'm not in bondage to that. I'm not in obedience to that. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for Jesus at that, at that point and uh, crying out to him. And sometimes this verse can be very helpful uh, to have committed to memory. In Hebrews 2.14, another wonderful verse about this idea of not being in bondage to fear there uh, the writer says inasmuch then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself jesus likewise shared in the same uh, he became like us incarnation that through death he might destroy him who had the power of death that is the devil he's the one that had the power before and release those who through fear of death for all their lifetime subject to the bondage wonderful thing to come to faith in Jesus Christ and you know, not that we're looking forward to it but uh, you no longer have to fear and be in bondage uh, to it uh, it's, a, it's just a different dynamic in terms of our relationship this kind of flows into the sixth thing the dynamic relationship includes a future inheritance this idea we made reference to of being heirs of Christ heir like is in a will you get named in the will you're an heir you get something what does that mean well you're the co-heir with Jesus Christ. Those stars at night, those are part of the year. I just thought I'd mention that. You can mention that next time you're a starry night, you're walking along, somebody doesn't know the Lord. See those stars? Part owner right there. You know? <laughs> Jesus and me, the whole thing. It's right in the Bible. Uh, this is meant to be to help us from becoming discouraged because uh, the idea is that as we'll read in a moment, life is not always easy. Uh, and we need to keep our eyes on the Lord and, and the future and what God has for us. This is what Jesus said. He said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. And where I am, there you also, uh, you may all be also. Uh, and again, Jesus is not like, you kind of hear these stories, well, a man has been working on that mansion for 2,000 years. It must be something special. No, he, he did it the next day. When he went to prepare a place for us, it was on the cross. Heaven's always been there. No, <laughs> we're, we're, heaven is outside the time space continuum. Heaven is there, and it's waiting. But Jesus didn't have to go build something. But he had to go to the cross and die for our sins. He went to prepare a place for us by dying for us and rising again from the dead. And he says that I will come back and I will take you. It means a violent snatching away. My, my opinion is he's talking about the rapture. I will come and take you to be with me. Wherever I'm at, that's where you're going to be from here on out. And uh, such a beautiful reminder of what the inheritance means. 1 Corinthians 2, 9. I love what Paul says here. We speak with the wisdom of God uh, uh, in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained for the ages for our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew. For had they known, they would have not crucified the Lord of glory. As it, as it is written, I have not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. The spirit of adoption is a pretty wonderful thing. Yeah, and uh, the dynamics of this new relationship, though at least they're, they're terms we're familiar with, uh, we, we probably maybe miss, miss how fabulous they, they really are and, and what they meant to the first century hearers of them. Uh, but they, they should throw our hearts uh, just as much. We have no duty to live to that old sin nature, but rather to the power of, of God's spirit. We have a new dynamic relationship with God as a result. Uh, third, uh, uh, we'll close with this. We've been given a, a new freedom from discouragement, as I just mentioned, and that's where we get to the second half of verse 17. If indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the suffering of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. So we can be free from discouragement by having an understanding of the future and uh, the glorious future uh, that, uh, that awaits us. And, uh, you know, we may not go through times like the Apostle Paul. And uh, uh, we, uh, we may not be beaten from our faith. We may not be martyred for our faith like many around the world are today. Uh, but it doesn't mean life is always easy either. 
and uh, we have loved ones that pass away, we get cancer, we go through hard times, and I can start going around the room, there's some just uh, incredible, uh, miraculous things that are going on in people's lives. There's some very hard things that uh, our people are going through as well. Uh, we do suffer in this life. It's, it is a fallen world. Uh, and, uh, and we experience it right along with everybody else that's, uh, that's living in it. Rains on the righteous and the unrighteous all, all at the same time. Uh, but if we have an understanding, it doesn't mean we have to be discouraged uh, in, in the middle of it. Uh, and, it uh, and it really should be different for, for us because we understand what uh, awaits the future. The Holy Spirit comforts us in our trials. He shows us that in the end, it'll be worth it. I was reading uh, or, or hearing about, and I read a little more about it this week, about an evangelistic crusade that Dion Moody did in Chicago uh, towards the end of the uh, 1800s. And uh, Dion Moody, if you're not familiar, just quickly, uh, just a guy with not a, a great education, uh, was ridiculed because of his lack of being able to speak very well. I don't know if he spoke pigeon or not, but uh, he didn't speak very well. Uh, but it didn't stop him from uh, preaching and leading uh, uh, leading to faith uh, in Christ at the uh, uh, late 1800s. Uh, along the way, he had been in contact with uh, a guy named uh, Ira Shanky, and uh, Ira Shanky became, uh, had a great voice, put this in a historical context. Uh, Ira Shanky served in the Revolutionary War, would sing hymns to the troops and stuff because they had a very, very powerful uh, voice. Uh, I, I hate to say, but he did take a job with the IRS for a little while. But uh, uh, that's when Moody met him and, and you know, would he, uh, hear, heard him sing and invited him to come be part of his crusade. So praise God, he left the IRS. Uh, and uh, was a full time with, uh, with Moody at that point. They traveled uh, uh, back and forth uh, uh, to Great Britain and uh, had many crusades. But in this one in Chicago at, uh, at the uh, end of the late 1800s, uh, uh, Irish Shanky got up to, to sing. And he sang a song uh, having to do with our subject matter here. Uh, and by the time he was done singing it, then uh, Bill Moody, the great evangelist, stood up and, and really realized he did not need to preach. And he just, he just gave an invitation. Not hundreds, but thousands of people came forward to receive Christ. What did they hear? They heard this song. When all my labors and trials are o'er, and I'm safe on that beautiful shore, just to be near the dear Lord I adore, will through the ages be glory for me. When by the gift of this infinite grace I'm accorded in heaven a place, just to be there to look on his face will through the ages be glory for me. Friends will be there. I am long loved long ago. Joy like a river around me will flow. Yet just a smile for my Savior I know will through the ages be glory for me. Oh, that will be glory for me, glory for me, glory for me. When by his grace I shall look on his face, that will be glory. No preaching. A lot of people that said, uh, sign me up. I think that sounds pretty good to me. And uh, also a point at the end, he's going to continue in the text. This leads him the thread into the next uh, uh, paragraph in our text. This idea that, as he says, the suffering that we go through now, whatever it is, is nothing compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. So much that we have in this new dynamic relationship. Uh, God help us and not live according to the flesh, but be controlled by the Spirit. But it's something you and I have to decide every day when we get up, whether we will yield or not. A white glorious thing to be able to say, oh, the Father, cry out like a little kid any time in distress. Some of us over 40 times. If you are hurting me, it's a good place to go to and see what others have done, what others have said during, during times of duress. Uh, but he is there and he is waiting and he is listening. He will lead and guide us by chapter and verse, and when there's not one, he'll lead us in other ways as well.
Yeah.